Hey guys, thanks for coming. Um, so I'm a photographer and a filmmaker, and I've been working professionally for about five years now. And like most professional photographers and full-time artists, my first five years have mostly been comprised of experimenting and trying new mediums and crying to Lana Del Rey in the shower. <laughs> And I've been lucky enough to shoot some of who I believe are the world's most influential figures. People like my Auntie Norma, or my local hairdresser in Brooklyn, Alba, or all of my beautiful queer friends and family. And despite any success that I've had in the industry or any opportunities that I'm very grateful to have received, this is the work that I want to define my practice. Work that's inclusive of the people who matter to me and who inspire me. And I shoot in a way that's called poetic realism. And I don't mean poetry in form or in structure, but poetry is a kind of perspective or a way of thinking. I like to shoot people in places that we'd encounter every day. So you'll find me shooting in places like milk bars, or restaurants, or even public bathroom stalls, and marketplaces, and amplify the beauty that already exists within these spaces. And so through casting and lighting and set design, I'm able to construct an image that both feels like it's in an otherworldly place, but still be somewhere that you'd recognize as your own. And I don't shoot in this way just because of aesthetic principle or to make things look nice, but because it allows me to champion the narratives of my subjects within the spaces that they feel most comfortable. It's important for me not to sell you some kind of unattainable lifestyle that's too dissimilar from your own. I grew up in Australia both gay and with Filipino heritage, and inherently, like every artist, my identity and my experience not only informs the construction of my images, but provides me with a purpose to keep shooting. It's important for me to preface here as well that my experience as a white passing person of color is in no way comparable to the experiences of other people of color. And when we're having these discussions around identity politics, I think it's super important for us to always keep in mind and recognize our privileges as much as we recognize our disadvantages. So the discussion around diversity on screen isn't new, but it tends to focus more on equal opportunity in the industry, which of course is super important. But I feel like there's a side to the discussion that we don't discuss as frequently, and that's the effect that lack of representation has on shaping the mindset of our young audiences on us. When I was 14, a boy two years above me asked me out on MSN. And I cried all night at the relief of finally finding someone like me after years of feeling alone. But this relief was ripped from me when I got to school the next day to find him and his friends there pointing and laughing at me. And I realized that my first coming out experience had been taken away from me forever as a kind of prank to out me. And I was scared to go to school. And because I'm not out at this age, I have no one to speak to. It's the only time in my life that I can say that I felt suicidal. Now, at 23, naturally because of the industry that I'm in, when I look back, what I notice is that the films that I turned to and the music that I turned to actually kind of reinforced what the bullies were saying about me. That I should be ashamed to be gay. And so when looking at these films that I watch religiously, like She's the Man, or Clueless, or Mean Girls, they all told me that because I was gay, I would always be the butt of the joke. That my entire existence was some kind of comedic appendix to a white girl's struggle. And beyond this, what did they teach me about being Asian? All of these messages were coded into the books that I was reading and the music I was listening to and the films that I was watching. And because I'm at this super formative age, right, I'm taking it all in without question. And so when I was 14, I laughed with Cher from Clueless when it turned out that her crush Christian was gay. And I laughed at Damien being too gay to function. But it took me years to realize that by laughing at these characters written by heterosexual screenwriters, I was actually laughing at myself. And I wasn't scared to be gay because it made me different. I was scared to be gay because the only examples that I had to go off showed me a life of humiliation and loneliness. At that age, I needed to see positive examples of myself in the media in order to help me understand who I was. And to be honest, 
I didn't. And I like to define this with what's known as cultivation theory. Cultivation theory is used in media studies to describe the way in which excessive consumption of television can actually shape the worldview of its audiences. So a classic example would be how watching a TV show like Law and Order every night might lead someone to believe that people are being murdered outside their door more frequently than they actually are. Essentially, cultivation theory proves that the people behind the camera creating the content that we're digesting are in control of the way that people see the world around them, that the media we consume directly informs our perception of other people. So then, what does having few authentic queer characters of color on our Western screens teach us about others? about ourselves? And what effect does this have on teenagers and children who need these positive examples even more than we do and whose brains are even more suggestible than ours? Without genuine diversity, we're teaching young queer kids that we think they're invisible, that we think their stories aren't worth telling. And keep in mind that these are the kids who are three times more likely to develop mental health conditions and four times more likely to attempt suicide. And beyond this, from an intersectional lens too, what messages are we sending differently abled kids? Or gender non-conforming kids? Or kids from financially disadvantaged backgrounds? When I'm shooting a photo shoot, I'm making a film, or I'm writing a screenplay, all I'm thinking about at the end of the day is the kind of message that I'm sending to my audience. After the experience that I had growing up, I want cultivation theory to work with me, not against me. So when I'm doing a photo shoot, I decided to shoot my auntie instead of a model in this fashion editorial because I wanted to show people how sick it is to be Filipino and to show my high school bullies that I've got access to a chainsaw. <laughs> and I chose to shoot my beautiful queer friends with beautiful lighting because I want to show people that being queer doesn't have to be scary. And it's the primary consideration that I put into my casting, the kind of camera angles that I choose, or the way that I light an image. It's an amazing feeling for me as someone who used to want to suppress his Filipino heritage to now find joy and empowerment in bringing it to the forefront of my practice. And this is why I shoot in poetic realism, because I like to find beauty in the parts of my life that I used to be told weren't beautiful. And so the message that I want you to take away is this. Give marginalized artists an opportunity to be behind the camera and not just in front of it. There's a disconnect that I've noticed in the industry because everyone wants diverse casting, which is amazing, but when the people behind the camera who are in charge of their image don't understand their identity and don't understand their experience, that's when we begin to tokenize and stereotype. I'll never forget my experience on working on my first ever Hollywood feature film, The Weeknd, directed by the incredible Stella Makey, and how it felt to see an artist direct an entirely black cast in an authentic, complex narrative that had nothing to do with her race. But it was so simple, just seeing an artist making an artwork that other people with shared experience could resonate with. So the next time you read another article about a character being whitewashed, I don't want you to only think of the actor who missed the opportunity, but also think about the message that that sends to an unhappy teenager that identified with that role. And next time you see someone crying to Moonlight or crying to Crazy Rich Asians, Realize that you're witnessing the power of inclusion firsthand. After all the microaggressions and the bullying and the experiences that I had coming to terms with my identity, this is the reason why I shoot what I do. All I'm thinking about is a young person that comes across my work and how that would feel for them to see themselves included. Because I know how that would have felt to me. If someone comes across my work and feels that little bit more comfortable in their own skin, then I've done my job. My dad has this one saying, if the effort saves even one life, it's worth it. And this is the true power of representation, in front and behind the camera. Diversity isn't a box to tick. And it's not a trend to follow or a buzzword to make you click on an article. This power of representation has the potential to change lives to change the way that an entire society perceives us, but even more importantly, to change the way that we see ourselves. Thank you.